Okay, so everyone, welcome to Castlevania Then and Now. This is a history of the Castlevania franchise. So, let's begin. What you see up here right now is a timeline for Castlevania. Now, bear in mind, this is not all of Castlevania as an entire franchise. This is just more or less the main timeline. So we're going to talk about most of this. We're going to talk about some of the other things, but there's no way gonna, we're going to be able to cover all of it because there's a lot. I'll try to touch on the main things, and we'll see what else we have time for at the end. So obviously there's going to be spoiler warnings because we're talking about the entire year of the franchise, but I'm going to do my best to avoid those so that those who haven't played it don't get spoiled. And prepare for time travel because we're not going to go in a linear fashion. We're going to be jumping all over the place. So let's head on in. Fuck yeah! All right. So let's start with the basic story of Castlevania. It's pretty simple across most of the games. Typically, the series focuses on the Belmont family fighting Dracula. And they wield the whip, the vampire killer, which is the weapon to surpass the Dark Lord. In other words, this is the thing that's best at killing Dracula and pretty much everything undead. This series spans a millennia, and every 100 years, Dracula comes back to life. Usually stronger than last time, though it depends on what you choose to take from the canon, because it's all over the place. And sometimes he comes back earlier because bad people resurrect him for bad reasons. It's pretty much good and evil, and it's as simple as that. And sometimes we have heroes that aren't Belmonts. So, whoops. The different faces of Vania. For those of you that know anything about the franchise, there's typically two kinds. They call it either Classic Vania or Metroid Vania. So a Classic Vania game, We'll, get, well, there's also 3D Castlevania, sorry. <laughs> and then there's also Lords of Shadow. So you've got four main different types of Castlevania. And it can get kind of confusing. So let's start with what is a classic Vania. This is how the series started. Strictly action platformer. You jump, you whip, you fight enemies. There's not really any RPG elements. You just move through stages. You know, level one, level two, so on and so forth. You have a score and a time. You've got a limited number of lives. There's not a whole lot of exploration. You're pretty much going from point A to point B, which is basically from left to right across the screen, and then maybe from right to left again. It's, it's an arcadey kind of experience. It's, it's more skills-based. You've got to learn your enemy's patterns and exploit them. And typically, you're using a whip as your main weapon. And this would be Vampire Killer. Uh, funny story is, the reason that Konami developed a hero with a whip was to set it apart from other games at the time. Because the sword was just too basic, so hey, why not make it a whip? So now we're getting into the question of, what is Metroidvania? Well, the name kind of gives it away. If you know anything about Metroid, it's about ex exploration. Exploration, upgrades, things like that. So the, the focus here in a Metroidvania game is on exploration. It's still an action platformer, but now we're moving around Dracula's castle and we're finding secrets and going to areas that you would, you know, that are hidden in walls and in the floor. There's also no pitfall deaths this time around. So whereas in a classic Vania game, if you fall in a hole, you're dead. In a Metroidvania, if you fall down, you're gonna land from a super high height and then make a superhero landing. There's also RPG elements because combat would get really monotonous if you're walking around the castle back and forth and enemies keep respawning. So you gotta level up, there's gotta be some incentive to beat the baddies. You've also got more weapons, you've got diverse characters, you know, you can, uh, you can change your equipment. There's swords, there's shields, daggers, so on and so forth. They drop the stage-based format for the most part and you have one large map to explore. So Lords of Shadow, I mentioned that as being different from Castlevania, and there's a good reason for that. As you can see in the photo up there of Patrick, 
Mercury Steam, the developer of Castlevania Wars of Shadow, was kind of just like, hey, what if we took Castlevania and made it something else? And then they all thought it was a good idea and went through with it. Now, <laughs> getting into the series of the real, I mean, getting into the history of the real series, we'll start with the classic Vania games. And specifically, we'll begin with the NES era. So, Castlevania 1, the game that started it all, which came out in 1986. That's older than I am. This is an old game, an old franchise. It has a lot of history. The first hero ever to grace the series was Simon Belmont, and he trounces through Transylvania from the village of Wallachia all the way to Dracula's castle, and he beats the crap out of Dracula and all his baddies alone with a whip, looking like a barbarian, like Conan the Barbarian, at least in this entry. Later on, he'll look a lot different. This is a short clip of the game, right? Okay, so that gives you a little idea of uh, what it's about. You know, you're basically just jumping and whipping. Lots of jumping and whipping across six stages in this first game. And most of your enemies are from horror uh, movies, literature, and, and so on. Uh, so you'll see things like Frankenstein and Igor, uh, Medusa, as if that wasn't weird enough, uh, the Grim Reaper, all these different enemies. Not a whole lot of vampires, though. Um, and of course, you saw the whip, Vampire Killer. Uh, what you didn't really see much of there, you saw it drop from a candle, was uh, a sub-weapon, the dagger. There's also more of those. There's the axe, there's the cross, holy water, stopwatch. Those are the staples of the series. And each of those weapons is powered by hearts, which you also get from busting candles. Not sure what the logic is there, but, it, you know, that's what it is. Bust a candle. Yeah. I feel good. Yeah. So these sub-weapons, they all have different effects. You hold up, and you press your attack button, and you'll use it. So for the dagger, for instance, when you activate it, it'll throw a dagger across the screen. If you activate the axe, it'll throw an axe in an upward arc, so you can hit enemies that are above you. Gives you a little more diversity, adds to your, your repertoire, so you can have a strategy to beat a boss. Uh, another interesting thing that I find funny, and I always like to mention, is that when you break certain parts of the wall, you'll occasionally find pot roast in there, a big steak. Why you would eat something that you found in the walls of Dracula's centuries-old castle, I don't know. And why it heals you rather than making you sick and killing you, I, I don't know. But hey, it's a video game, it works. Uh, Castlevania was a pretty straightforward game for the time. Uh, it had some replayability. You know, you beat it and then you got hard mode and it started right over at the beginning. So uh, for, if you're a masochist like me, you know, you, you play that. And now we have a time travel warning because rather than going to Castlevania 2, we're going to Castlevania 3. We're skipping a number. So, <laughs> the reason for this is because the two games are much more similar than Castlevania 1 and 3 are to 2. So, this one is actually a prequel, taking place in 1476, as Simon's grandfather, Trevor Belmont. And this time around, you get a supporting cast, since Trevor's clearly not as good as Simon, he needs help. Anyway, uh, the cast is Sypha, Grant, and Alucard, who's actually Dracula's son. And he'll appear later on in the series, and we'll talk about that more later. Uh, this game also has multiple endings, and Koji Igarashi, who would later produce the series, says that this is his favorite of the ones he did not make. So the gameplay is very much the same as Castlevania 1, except for the fact that you now have a tag team. You get to choose an ally as you go through the game, and you can switch them as time goes on, but you can only have one at a time. You have Grant, who's more of an acrobatic character. He can climb on walls and the ceiling. Uh, you have Sypha, who does magic, so her sub-weapons are vastly more powerful than every other character. And you have Alucard, who, in my opinion, is useless aside from his bat form because it can get you over obstacles. 
And this game also introduced passwords, so you did not have to lose your progress. This was the archaic save file. Nowadays, we actually have save files, so we don't need passwords. Uh, there were also branching paths. So every time you beat a stage, you get to select where you want to go next, and it would affect how the game played out. So this offered it a bit of replayability. And of course, if you're a masochist, there's hard mode after you beat it. Fun facts, this game sports the biggest list of regional differences. The ones to note are that uh, Grant plays entirely different. In the US, he stabs, whereas in Japan, he actually threw daggers across the screen. So he's pretty much useless in the, the US version. Uh, the US version is also harder than the Japanese version, and not necessarily in a fair way. As you progress through the game in the US version, every enemy deals increasing more, increasingly more damage. And it's the same across the board. Whereas in the Japanese version, each enemy deals its own amount of damage. So you'll die much more easily at the end of the US game than you will at the Japanese one. USA. <laughs> it's, it's funny because usually Japan makes their games easier for the US, but this time they made it harder for us. It's like, they're like, hey, let's, let's see if they're actually good enough. Well, okay, they are. Uh, the other thing that, in my opinion, makes the Japanese version better than the US version is it had a sound chip called the v, uh, VRCVI. What it did was it allowed for uh, better quality music, which in Castlevania is a big deal because this series, it's got pretty good music. Most fans note it for that. So several things, fairness and sound, put the Japanese version, in my opinion, above the US version. A uh, little story, uh, story trivia because I'm really into Dracula as a whole, not just Castlevania, but this game makes allusions to Vlad the Impaler. He actually died in the same year this game takes place. The real man, I mean. So, if you look at it from that standpoint, it's kind of like, well, what if Vlad the Impaler died and came back after making a pact with these dark gods and now he's getting revenge on everyone who killed him? So that's a cool little tidbit. And the other thing is that Grant, whose last name is Dynasty, was actually, uh, his name was actually among the family of royals who rebelled against Vlad the Impaler. So the fact that you have this guy who shares a name of a family that repelled, rebelled against the real person and then is fighting against Dracula in this game is another little nod to the real, uh, real historical figure. Uh, another piece of trivia is that this game would later be retconned by Lament of Innocence and Symphony of the Night. Again, I'll talk more about that as we get there. And this game also introduced the Belmont Warlord chromosomes. Ridiculous as that sounds. Um, it plays prominent sometimes in the series and then other times it's forgotten about. But basically, each descendant of the Belmonts will get stronger and this chromosome allows them to wield a vampire killer whip, whereas no one else can. I don't know why chromosomes affect the whip, but... Yeah. It's Castlevania. You throw logic out the window. <laughs> yes, nano machines. Konami, the original nano machines. So Castlevania Two: Simon's Quest. This one we're getting to now because it's a black sheep, and we'll just touch on it for that fact. It sets some precedents for the later series. Um, it has a terror bad translation, which at times is hilarious and other times frustrating because you need to know what people are telling you to do to beat this game. What a terrible night. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about that. It's kind of like the Lynx Adventure of Castlevania. Not in a good way. Um, it has some RPG elements. There's day-night cycles. There's uh, permanent upgrades, and there's, there's a sense of time. There's basically no castle in the game until the end, and uh, you journey across Transylvania a lot, doing things that don't really seem to involve Dracula until the very end. So, some quotes worth remembering from this game, and it's terrible translation. What a horrible night to have a curse, which happens at sunset. The morning sun has vanquished the horrible night, which happens at sunrise. You now possess 
Dracula's rib, which is when you get Dracula's rib. Let's live here together, some old woman, and take my daughter, please, some old man, as if the last one wasn't creepy enough. We're going to quickly mention the Game Boy games, too, which play very much like the NES games. Uh, you play as Christopher Belmont. This takes place between Castlevania 3 and Castlevania 1, so this would be Simon's grand, yeah, grandfather. Too many years, I'm mixing it up. <laughs> but before Castlevania 1, between Castlevania 3, um, the reason I like to mention them is because they had Castlevania Rebirth, I think in 2008, and it was a really pretty game. It was a remake of the adventure, and it was really good. But we'll move on to the 16-bit era since we're trying to stick to the main stuff. And we have Super Castlevania 4. How many people here consider this to be their favorite? Wow, no favorites for Castlevania 4? I'm surprised. Usually this one tops lists. Before they went to Metroidvania? Okay. Fa Raise your hand if it's your favorite Classicvania. Okay, now, now we've got some hands. All right. So, there was a bit of confusion with this one in the U.S. when it first came out because they called it a sequel here, but in Japan it was a remake. Officially, it is a remake, and it sports improved graphics and a really good soundtrack. This is a bit of gameplay from it. You can see the difference. Okay, so as you can see, the game plays much smoother than it was in the past. You have eight-way whipping, which unfortunately doesn't come back to the main series, but it was the coolest thing here, and it made you overpowered, super overpowered, to the point that you really didn't need sub-weapons, but it was really fun to use. Uh, your whip, like I said, best thing in there, and you could use it to swing from certain grappling points. Unfortunately, they didn't really use that to their advantage. I, I personally think they could have used it more, but when it is there, it's really, really cool. Uh, this game also set the precedent for controlled jumps. So rather than being locked into your direction when you jump, you can actually change directions midair. Uh, you can jump on the stairs now rather than having to walk to the bottom of them and then press up. And if you jump onto the stairs just right, you can moonwalk. So with the cool soundtrack and jumping onto the stairs right, you get to dance like Michael Jackson. And as I said, this game was really easy. Easy peasy. A breeze. Because that whip is just too powerful. The next game from the 16-bit era that I'm going to discuss is Castlevania Rondo of Blood. Which came out on the PC engine in Japan. It starred Richter Belmont. And had some supporting cast members such as Maria, who you could play as. And then Annette, Tara, and Iris, or Iris, depending on how you want to say it, who you would uh, rescue throughout your quest. This game sported anime, or animated cutscenes. Yeah, it was animated cutscenes, now that I think about it. Uh, and CD quality music. And it would have a big impact on the series. It would determine the future aesthetic, and it would directly spawn a sequel in Symphony of the Night. The gameplay kind of reverts when you consider Castlevania 4 came before it, because now the eight-way whipping is gone. You're back to the straight whip. But they did make progress in some areas. They took away whip upgrades. So in prior games, you had to break candles and get upgrades, similar to how you'd get sub-weapons and hearts, to make your whip longer and to give it a chain attack. But they took that out in this. So you, you just always have the chain whip. They also added Item Crash, which is a cool little thing where if you have enough hearts, you get to activate a super attack for your sub-weapon. So for instance, let's say you have Holy Water. 
if you choose to use an item crash, you expend 15 hearts to make it rain holy water on all your enemies. So that's really, really cool when you think about it. You're fighting a vampire and it just starts raining holy water. What's going to survive that? What undead creature? Uh, you also get to play as Maria, as I said earlier. And she... It's, it's kind of like in Castlevania 4, how it sets a precedent for smoother gameplay. She can double jump, she can slide, she's a little bit faster than Richter. If I'm not mistaken, she's a little bit more frail, but overall easier to play as. And her sub-weapons are more powerful. This game also had branching paths similarly to Castlevania 3, except that these branching paths were inside the stages, so it encouraged you to explore a bit. And a cool little thing was that you get ninja skills because Richter can backflip. Whoops. Those up there are the item crashes. A couple examples of them. You can see it's raining holy water on the left, and you've got the axe super attack on the right. It also got a port, quote unquote port. It really wasn't a port for the SNES. Uh, you only get to play Richter in this one. It's harder. There's less stages. There's arguably better music. The SNES fans like to say the music's better, but, you know, it's tomato, tomato. And they completely take out the character of Shaft, who in Rondo of Blood is the guy that actually resurrects Dracula. So kind of an important plot point that they just took out. The better remake, and a real remake, is Dracula X Chronicles. This game, if you have a PSP or Vita, is worth buying, because it's three games in one. You get the Rondo of Blood remake, you get the original Rondo of Blood, and you get Symphony of the Night. I don't like the voice acting in Symphony of the Night, this remake of it, but, you know, you can't argue with three games for one. Uh, it also replaces the anime art style, and as you can see in the box art, adds the cool gothic art style in, which fits much better with Castlevania, if you ask me. It has a remastered soundtrack, boss rush mode, it adds, it adds stuff to the alternate stage five. Uh, in some areas it's easier, in some areas it's harder, and Dracula gets a new form. So, to quote the meme, it wasn't his final form in Rotten of Blood. And Castlevania Bloodlines rounds up the 16-bit era, and I like to talk about this one because it's a little different. Uh, it's the first game that has you star that stars a whip user that is not a Belmont. And his, the other playable character is Eric Ricard, which, if you don't already know, is a play on Alucard, Dracula's son. And this game is cool because it makes a lot more connections to Bram Stoker's Dracula. In fact, John Morris, who you're playing, is the son of Quincy Morris, who was one of the heroes that killed Dracula in the novel. This also takes place during World War I, starting with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, which was orchestrated by Dracula's niece, Elizabeth Bartley. And this is the first time the whip is also named. Uh, as I said, two playable characters in this game. Um, crystals, this time replace hearts. It's just an aesthetic difference. And there's three upgrades instead of two. So when you get the third upgrade for your whip, it has blue fire. So that's another cool little thing. They do bring back directional whipping, but it's not eight way you can whip at a downward diagonal angle when you jump. And rather than just go through Dracula's castle, you go all across Europe, fighting in the war, which has zombies and skeletons and all other kinds of monsters. So this is the fun part that I like to talk about, which is all the trivia and quirks of Castlevania Bloodlines. This game, when it came out, was rated GA for general audiences, even though it was pretty gory. Uh, the opening sequence actually has a pool of blood running, and this somehow got past censors in North America, but was censored in Europe and Australia. So that's, I don't know why that happened, but it did. Uh, another thing that was censored in Western countries was uh, Eric's appearance. He was pretty feminine looking, uh, bisho is the term for that in Japan, and they changed that to make him look more masculine in America. Uh, I don't know why the gore makes it through, but that doesn't, but it does. 
Uh, for the fans of Castlevania's music, this is where Michiru Yamane made her debut. And this game has a fantastic soundtrack. A lot of the, the tracks that show up here become staples. And this one's a little silly, but Dracula's Staircase in this game runs from right to left. Whereas in the past, it always ran from right... Uh, or sorry, runs from left to right in this game, ran from right to left in past games. Some more trivia. Uh, I mentioned the blue fire already, which uh, in Japan, that signifies uh, like a spirit fire. And later on in this series, we'll learn that Vampire Killer, when wielded by someone who's not a Belmont, drains their life force. So that's a cool little tidbit to know for later. Uh, I mentioned the Eric Lacard, Alucard thing. And uh, Elizabeth Bothery, Dracula's niece in this game, is based on a real woman, Elizabeth Bothery, who was, um, I think it was a Hungarian countess, who was actually related to Dracula in real life, but she was a distant cousin. This woman is infamous in history because she was known for murdering young women and bathing in their blood to stay young. And Drolta, who is a witch in Castlevania Bloodlines, was actually her servant in real life. So crazy little history things there. So that wraps up the Classicvania games and we'll move into the Metroidvanias. So we're going back in time again. This is when Castlevania underwent its metamorphosis. Starts with Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which came out in 1997. And you're playing as Alucard. Yes, the same guy from Castlevania III, Dracula's son. And it takes place in 1797, just years after Rondo of Blood took place. This is the first game that was headed by Koji Igarashi, also known as Iga, who would end up becoming the producer for the series. This game, when it first came out, even though it's now considered one of the best, probably one of the best games of all time, at least on the PlayStation, it wasn't really popular when it first came out. Uh, it revolutionized the series, though. As we talked about before, uh, Classicvania is very straightforward. Straight-up action game. This makes it all about exploration and atmosphere and adventure and most of the subsequent entries would try to emulate it. So, rather than me tell you about the gameplay differences, I'll let you see them. So as you can see, that presentation is entirely different. It's, it's on a whole other level. It's the same thing, essentially. A hero storming the castle, going through the gates, and then fighting the enemies at the start. I mean, look, even zombies reappear. But entirely different in the field. So, like I said, direct sequel to Rondo. It's five years after Vic, uh, Richter's victory. Uh, it features cutscenes. Well, not first for the series, but... Uh, in a way that was different than even Rondo managed to pull off. It features voice acting, which I consider the best ever. It's terror bad. Uh, who here knows the, the scene? What is bad? <laughs> who, who wants to be Dracula? Who wants to be Dra No one? You want to be Dracula? Sure. You in the back? You know the lines? Yeah. All right, come on up. Sit up here. Who wants to be Richter? Let's go, Richter. Oh. You're gonna need this. 
Yeah. You ready? Yeah. All right. Action. Die, monster. You don't belong in this world. It was not by my hand that I am once again given flesh. I was brought here by humans who wish to pay me tribute. Tribute? You steal men's men souls and make them your slaves. Perhaps the same. Oh, yeah. could be said of all. Perhaps the same could be said of all religions. Your words. <laughs> your words. Your words. Your words. No, your, word, your words are empty as your uh, as your soul. Man can't ill to need a savior such as you. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk. Have at you. Woo! All right, guys, come here. Come grab a prize from the prize box. Choose whatever you like. <laughs> that was awesome. Anything from the box? Whatever you like. I don't. I, I guess. <laughs> I mean, you can. Oh shoot. Anyway, so voice acting, as you guys just saw, the best ever. This game had multiple endings, and unlike previous entries, they're actually different this time. And there's actual character development. There's a real story now. Gameplay, as we saw, way more fluid. You can backdash at the press of a button. It's much faster, much faster. Uh, there's RPG elements and equipment and magic spells and familiars and relics and usable items and a shop so your money means more than just a score it's there's so much customization you can do so many secrets to discover basically you can create a play style that that fits what you want to do within reason of course uh i mean if you want to use a dagger use a dagger if you want to punch with your fists use your fists if you want to use a mace or a sword it's it's totally up to you and one thing I always like to mention, because Richter is my favorite Belmont, yeah. is Richter mode in this game, yeah. where you play possibly the most overpowered Belmont, making it rain holy water on everything. He's not this good in his own game. In Rondo of Blood, he's like a normal Belmont, but in this, somehow he's like Superman. He's just destroying everything. His health is low, but his attack, pff, through the roof. One shot. One shot everything. Rains holy water across the, t in the entire screen. It's, it's ridiculous. The graphics in this are also better. It's incredibly detailed. For something 2D, there's a lot in there. And that adds immensely to the atmosphere. The thing this game does that makes it stand out, even this far ahead in the future, is the atmosphere. It's so immersive. It's got this cool, gothic, renaissance, baroque, classical style. And it's, it's got a little bit of 3D in there, but it's mostly 2D graphics, 2D sprites. And even though they're reused from Rondo of Blood, they've been updated, so they look better. There's, there's a really cool death animation for both Alucard and Richter where they dissolve into blood. And that's just really, like, it, it sounds kind of gory, but it's, it's cool when you see it, I promise. And Alucard, his sprite is considered one of the most detailed in 2D history for gaming. As you can see from the gameplay, there's the after image flowing behind him. His hair is moving in all these different ways. It's, there's a lot of detail in there. The music. The music is also a very different approach to this game. Again, it leans more toward atmosphere than those kind of rock-inspired tracks of the past. And at times it's catchy, at times it's spooky. It kind of shifts with the stage. The interesting thing is that Michiru Yamane, this time around, she would play the stages without music and then compose based on what she played. So that's why when you're playing this game, everything just feels right. As far as trivia and secrets go, there is, there is a lot to talk about. Pretty much every Metroidvania, there's a lot. But I think Symphony of Night has the most or at least to me it's the most interesting. I'll touch on some of the, the more interesting ones. There is references to a wide range of mythology, folklore, and literature. 
So it's not just limited to your campy horror stuff like the older games. You've got things from Norse mythology popping up. You've got uh, references to Tolkien, you know, Lord of the Rings. Uh, there's Gothic stuff, Lovecraftian, so on and so forth. Um, there's, an, there's a piece of equipment called a stone mask, which for you JoJo fans out there, is a direct reference to the stone mask from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. And you find it in the library of all places. In Outer Wall, which is one of the areas of the castle, there's a bit of a spoof for Simon. So for all the Simon fans out there, unfortunately he ended up hanging from his whip outside the castle, or someone looking like him at least. Uh, a little piece of trivia is that this game originally was gonna have a fifth ending that got removed. The data for it was found when someone mined the disc, and it was a really dark ending. It was cool, it, it would've been cool if it made it into the game, but it didn't, unfortunately. And what was it? basically, it ends up with Alucard having to kill both Richter and Maria. So it was, it was pretty dark. Ouch. Yeah, it was, it's rough. You can actually listen to the audio for it online if you, go, if you go to YouTube and look for it, but there's no video with it, unfortunately. Uh, another interesting piece of information is that according to Koji Igarashi, this game was inspired by Legend of Zelda, not Metroid. But the fans decided it was Metroid, so it stuck. And lot, there's a, a set of bosses that appear in this game that were the cast of Castlevania III, except for Alucard, and you can see them in the top photo there. They were zombie impersonations. And now, we're gonna move on to the GBA trilogy. So welcome to Rehash Heck. If my computer will cooperate. There we go. Castlevania Circle of the Moon. We're gonna to touch briefly on this because it did get retconned, but it was a really good game. It brought the difficulty back for a while. Symphony of the Night was a pretty easy game, still fun. Still provided a fair challenge, but easy in comparison to the old Castlevanias. This was difficulty for the Metroidvania era, uh, era. And you don't play a Belmont in this time, which is why it got retconned. And it's not Vampire Killer that he's using. And now we're going to jump through time again. Because we're going to Harmony of Dissonance, which takes place after Castlevania 1. And you're playing... Uh, I'm never sure how to pronounce his name. I'm gonna say just. Juiced. 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 Okay, Juiced. But he looks just like Alucard with a whip. Yeah. And he's Simon's grandson. And the gameplay is pretty much the same as Circle of the Moon. You're whipping everything. You don't get access to other equipment. Um, but you do have a new magic system in spell books. And you dash everywhere. You can dash left and right this time around. The music, I felt, wasn't as good as previous entries. Still good for a video game, just not up to par with Castlevania. Again, just my personal opinion. It was super duper easy, especially after Circle of the Moon. This was kind of like their balancing act, like, okay, we made it too hard last time, let's make it easier. But it ended up being too easy. And it also pulled the, the parallel castle scheme, which is another two, two castle thing that returned from Symphony of the Night. So it felt, it felt kind of boring and contrived. And once again, we're doing a big time jump. We're going to Castlevania, Aria of Sorrow, which is the third and final game for the GBA trilogy. And in my opinion, this is the best one. It's balanced in terms of challenge, in terms of gameplay. Everything is great. Uh, Michiru Yamane returns for this soundtrack. Uh, it takes place in the future with Soma Cruz, who's your typical high school exchange student in Japan. Uh, interesting note, in the Japanese version, he was not an exchange student. If you're playing the US version, he's an American exchange student in Japan. If you're playing the European version, he's a European exchange student in Japan. So they make it fun for everyone. Soma has the power of dominance. He can absorb the souls of monsters in Dracula's castle and he harbors a super duper secret, but he just wants to live a normal life. I've never seen that anything. With a coat like that. 
This game takes place in the future, and Dracula is dead. For real this time. He's not coming back. He died in the 1999 Demon Castle War, and they never really explain exactly what happened, and they never make a game based on what happened, so we'll never really know. But Soma somehow winds up transported to Dracula's castle anyway, which exists in an eclipse. Somehow he gets there through going to a Japanese shrine. Again, I, I don't know how they make this stuff up. <laughs> And like I said, he's got the power of dominance, and now he's here in this castle that needs a new dark lord, and there's someone else trying to become the new dark lord, the new evil for Earth that, that needs to happen, the new Dracula. There's a cool plot twist for those that know it. I won't spoil it for those that don't, but this game actually, much as I make fun of some of the story elements, is really good. This and Symphony of the Night, I would say, are probably two of the better story-driven Castlevanias. Or rather than, than story-driven, they're just the better Castlevanias with above-average stories. Uh, gameplay, say bye-bye to a uh, vampire killer because it's, it's gone. It was sealed in the castle during the 1999 Demon Castle War. So there's a story reason as to why it's gone. Um, this one was middle ground challenge-wise, so they found that right balance between Circle of the Moon and Harmony of Dissonance. The power of dominance plays a big role where now enemies drop their souls, which their abilities become yours as your sub-weapons. And we see the return of equipment, so no whip, but you've got swords, hammers, maces, daggers, so on and so forth. And a new weapon class. You get to bang, bang, pew, pew, bust a cap in a vampire's butt. <laughs> 21st century style vampire hunting. And now we'll move into the DS trilogy. <laughs> we'll touch quickly on Dawn of Sorrow, which was a direct sequel to Aria of Sorrow. Uh, it was pretty much unnecessary, if you ask me. The story was kind of just, they're trying to bring Dracula back again. But it improved the gameplay, and they improved Julius mode. So similar to how you play Richter in Symphony of the Night, you get to play Julius, who is the Belmont of the future, and the last of his lineage. Possibly, in the canon, the strongest Belmont. Uh, he's actually seen to destroy parts of the castle with his grand cross attack. But this Julius mode is a... Th oh, apparently I removed the slide. But it's a throwback to Castlevania 3 where you can switch characters. You get to play Alucard and uh, Yoko Belnades, who is a direct descendant of Saifa. So you get that cool character switching dynamic and there's actually an RPG element to it where you level up as you go through the castle. The next game in the DS trilogy is Portrait of Ruin. And this one starred Jonathan Morris, who is not to be confused with John Morris from Bloodlines, but this is his son. And this is a direct sequel to Bloodlines, taking place during World War II in 1944, where the death energy of World War II is used to bring back Dracula's castle. And a vampire named Bronner, who is also an artiste, has taken over the castle. So Jonathan Morris and Charlotte Olene, who is the girl in the picture and a spellcaster, do an assault on the castle to take Bronner out. Uh, Bronner paints a lot of stuff and leaves it around the castle, and you can actually jump into his paintings, and it's a whole other world. That's how good he is. The story was also very bubbly and anime-ish, so if you're upbeat and you like that kind of thing rather than the gothic stuff, this is for you. Uh, this game... As I said, has two main protagonists, so it pays homage to Castlevania 3. You have these two playable characters at all times, and you switch between them at will. You have Jonathan, who's all melee, wrapped into one. He's got whips, swords, daggers, spears, sub-weapons, martial arts, so you really get to play him however you want to play. Uh, you have Charlotte, who unfortunately kind of gets relegated to, su to the support role. Her magic is really powerful, but trying to use her for melee is tough, so you'll be playing as Jonathan most of the time. They add a dual crush, which is kind of like your item crush, where your two characters come and attack at once. And I mentioned the portraits before that Bronner uh, paints. They act as sub-stages. So while you still explore Dracula's castle, and that's the greater stage, within it, there's these other little pocket universes, I guess you could call them. So if you find Bronner's painting of a desert, you go into a desert stage. 
And there's a lot of replayability to this game. Uh, lots of different characters to play as. Um, hard mode, of course. And then there's also restrictions like, you know, you're limited to level 50 mode, you're limited to level 25, level one, if, if you want to put that challenge on yourself. Because this one was really easy without those being imposed. The next one in the DS trilogy, and possibly the most different for all of the 2D manias, is Order of Ecclesia. This one is the first game starring a woman as the main protagonist, which would be Shinoa, and it returns to the gothic art style after the anime art styles of the past two games. This is also the first time canonically that Vampire Killer does not appear at all in the game. This one takes place after Symphony of the Night, and the Belmonts and the Vampire Killer have vanished. They're gone. No one knows where they are. But multiple groups have sprung up to take their place, among them which is the Order of Ecclesia, who Shinoa works for. And she uses magical glyphs for weapon, which is something that the Order had designed to combat Dracula when he returns. There's also a very special glyph they made called the Dominus, which is very sinister, it's implied to be sinister, and in trying to infuse it to Shinoa's body, her jealous rival and sort of adopted brother Albus comes and steals it, which causes her to lose her memories and emotions. So the story is basically the retrieval of this power from the corrupt Albus. So this game used the glyph system, which is similar to the souls, uh, but also its own thing where Shinoa will absorb the glyphs into her back and they will provide her with weapons. So, for instance, you get a rapier glyph, and you can use the rapier sword. Two-handed wielding returns for the first time since Symphony of the Night, and nearly every attack that you do, whether it's melee or magic, takes MP. There's glyph unions, which are like your dual crushes, and this game was interesting because it went back to a stage-based format. You have smaller maps broken into stages, and you travel between them on a world map. It was also really, really hard for a Metroidvania, the hardest of them. But for those that are Castlevania purists, the challenge is nice, I guess. And uh, it's also very grindy, especially when you play on hard mode, you have to grind a lot. There's not just leveling up, but there's also leveling up your certain skills and aptitudes and different weapons. So if you wanna get really good with uh, a short sword and maximize your damage with it, you need to keep using that and killing enemies with it. This is a bit of the gameplay to show you how it changed. So as you can see, you can attack much faster in this one. Basically, you're gonna have to have your hand on your DS like this the whole time to keep alternating between attacks. We're now getting into the 3D entries, and I'm gonna speed through these a bit, because we're running short on time. So we're going way back in the timeline, back to the very beginning. Castlevania Lament of Innocence. This is the first one in the chronology. This is the start of the Belmont clan of Dracula and a vampire killer. And the villain this time is not Dracula, but is a vampire named Walter Bernhard. As I said, it's 3D. This was actually inspired by Devil May Cry. And as you can see here, well, this one, this is sort of what the gameplay's like. Just combine that with Metroidvania exploration in hallways that all look the same. It can get pretty monotonous, but that's not to say it's a bad game. It's still pretty fun and especially for the time it was good. Lament of Innocence didn't have experience or leveling up. Uh, you only had the whip to use, but you could change the whip's element. And there were relics and items that upgraded your abilities. Castlevania Curse of Darkness comes next. 
And even though this one got less favorable reviews, I personally think this one is the better of the two. It stars Hector, who's a Devil Forge Master, who originally worked for Dracula, and he'll be shown up in the anime, which we're gonna talk about later. Yeah. So this one was more in line with Symphony of the Night in the sense that you have a character that, again, looks like Alucard and uses swords and other things other than the whip. You also have familiars, which play a big role in the gameplay. And you have the villain Isaac this time, who is a rival Devil Forge Master, who gets Hector's wife killed. And Hector is going after him for revenge. This is also a direct sequel to Castlevania III, and Trevor Belmont appears, and he is a badass. So, I already talked about the story a bit. Um, basically, Dracula's curse is ravaging the land after death, after his death, and Isaac, fellow forger master, gets Hector's wife burnt at the stake, so he's going for revenge. Talked about the gameplay. The innocent devils are the familiars I mentioned. Um, there is no hub stage, as there was in Lament of Innocence. It's all just one big map. And then after this, when we're sticking to the main points of the series, Castlevania gets rebooted. And this is actual footage of Castlevania fans getting enraged. <coughs> Lords of Shadow came out in 2010, and it rebooted the entire series. We're going back to the beginning again. This time, the first Belmont is Gabriel. And this is taking place somewhere on Earth, maybe Europe, in 1047. And Hideo Kojima, quote unquote, helped out. He didn't really, they just kind of slapped his name on it. He was like, yeah, uh, I like what these guys are doing. Let's give them the chance. And Konami gave Mercury Steam the green light. <laughs> so this game takes place in an entirely different timeline, so it doesn't mess with the beauty that is the original Castlevania. Gabriel works for the Brotherhood of Light, and he's out to save the world from the end of days and avenge his wife by defeating the Lords of Shadow. And Dracula is not present in this game, technically. For those who know the ending, I won't really spoil it. Unless someone gives me the go-ahead, then I'll, I'll just rip uh, into this uh, game. Do it. Don't spoil. Raise of hands, who doesn't want the game spoiled? Okay. Let's talk about DLC. This game has a lot of Castlevania name drops and references, and something called the Combat Cross, which is kind of like a whip, but I don't know, it's different. And... Thank you, Kojima. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Kojima. <laughs> So, I'll talk about it when we get to LOS 2. So the gameplay, it's a 3D action adventure platforming puzzle kind of game, and it's sort of reminiscent of Lament of Innocence, but it's undeniably God of War in flavor. There's QTEs and brutal action and watered down yeah. Shadow of the Colossus boss fights. There's whip combat and sub weapons, but eh, I mean, whatever. You can call it Castlevania all you like, it's not really Castlevania, except for the middle part of the game. Uh, there's light and shadow magic, and it's kind of like Simon's Quest. It's a fun game, don't get me wrong, but it's really not Castlevania. Mirror of Fate. This takes place after Lords of Shadow, just a little bit after. And Gabriel has become Dracula, and they set this series up for the coolest story ever because you could have had a, a very good reason as to why the Belmonts were the ones cursed with defeating Dracula. But they dropped the ball big time in every single way. This game just failed to deliver on everything. It was like it got you to the moment and then stopped right there. Lords of Shadow 2, uh, which I thought might redeem Mirror of Fate, didn't. It takes place in Castlevania City in 2057. Somehow we jump, we jump from the 11th century all the way to the 21st century, and Dracula's been asleep for a millennia. There's been no Belmont fighting Dracula in between these, these games. So like I said, he wakes up after centuries of sleep. Satan is returning to the world, and Dracula has to be the hero that's going to stop him. It's, it's messed up. It's messed up. You still have Dracula as a Belmont. He's just using the Shadow Whip now instead of the Combat Cross. Like I said, so many problems. This story constantly falls short. Castlevania never really had a good story to begin with, but they, they were promising a good story here, and they messed up. It never finds its identity. It feels like generic fantasy. You could have been playing Lord of the Rings for all I care. It goes over the top into edge mode way too much. 
It's super angsty. Gabriel is like all the teenage angst you can possibly fit into an immortal body. It's scatterbrained, there's plot holes, Dracula's still a Belmont in terms of gameplay, even the fact that he's just an anti-hero rather than a villain. So many problems. And the trailer was so cool. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit because we're running short on time. Or not. <laughs> we'll watch it. <laughs> so cool so cool and they screwed it up they had an all-star cast of voice actors they had Robert Carlyle who's great they had a uh, Richard Madden as Alucard it's so many things they dropped the ball on Patrick Stewart was in it I don't know what they did wrong but now we look toward the future maybe there's something bright on the horizon like what Richter's looking at I don't know where does Castlevania go from here does Konami have any plans? I bet not. <laughs> pachinko! That's, that's happening, yeah! Coming to a pachinko hall near you! I saw it in Japan, it sucks. Just like Silent Hill. Yup. Erotic violence, whatever that means. Yeah. All I want to do is take your money. Paper planes, anyone? Richter has a combat cross, why? I don't know. But there is some bright stuff. Yeah. On the horizon, not from Konami though. Bloodstained, which is a, a spiritual successor to Castlevania, will be coming. And it's developed by Iga, the guy that produced the series from Symphony of the Night onwards. Uh, like I said, break from Konami, fresh start. He's doing what he wants to do. There's also Castlevania, the animated series, which I'm sure is the reason why some of you are here today. And it's great. Season 2 is coming soon. 1026, just in time for spooky Halloween. And there's a trailer out for season two now. No further. My 
my generals in killing my wife. Please. Humanity has proven to me that they don't deserve the Earth. We will scour them off the land. My father, he's gone mad. But now he's going to destroy the world. Human scheme and betray. They all must die. Imagine it. A world without humans. Under endless night. to be destroyed. We can't fail. Maybe it's possible to do Castlevania's story right. I don't know. But, like I said, I didn't get to talk about everything in this panel. There's obviously not enough time, and I could talk about Castlevania all night if given that much time. But I can't. So things that didn't make the cut were Castlevania Legends and 64 games, uh, Judgment, which is a horrible, horrible fighting game, the puzzle game for iOS, which don't, don't bother playing it, Army of Despair, which is kind of cool for a little bit when you're playing with friends, but ultimately, eh. And then there's some new iOS game, but come on, who, who wants to play Castlevania on a smartphone? There's also the Castlevania 1 remakes, so those are really cool if you want to play something that's a little more updated. Uh, I personally recommend Castlevania Chronicles, and this is where Simon becomes much more effeminate, but the artwork is so much better, so more power to them. So, other than that, I mean, I want to hear some of your thoughts. What about this trailer for season two? What, what, are, what is everyone thinking about this? In the back? Yeah, uh, I saw a guy with two knives. What, do you think that's Grant, or... It could he possibly... He wasn't in season one. Yeah. yeah, he wasn't in season one. I was thinking that it might be that monster that was transforming that they showed, because, as you know, in Castlevania three, he was a monster until you beat him and separated yeah. the curse. So, who else? Yes. You should watch the trailer that they have on Netflix. You see more of that cute little white hair man. Oh, the, the Netflix trailer with Hector. There I did two, see that, actually. Two additional, if no one else knew, the YouTube one isn't as good as the one on Netflix. That's right. When, as she was saying, the Netflix trailer, it has Hector in it for, for just a little bit. You get to see him. So it makes you, it makes you wonder. Is Isaac going to be in this too? And what role is he going to play? A any other thoughts? Okay, I guess we'll wrap it up then. You don't know anything about Castlevania, so you're going to learn today.